study on modeling deep time atmospheric carbon flux using 5G plates. Um, unlike uh, Sabine's lecture, Sabine's uh, presentation, Steve Mars' presentation, and uh, Jody's presentation, I'll be looking uh, more into the actual workflows and in into a lower level, uh, rather than discuss the results or discuss the objectives. But I will um, briefly gloss over the objectives in my first slide. Uh, I'll describe the tools and technology that we use. I'll step through the information of the three workflows that we created. I'll describe some, some of the features that, came, that was implemented in our workflow. I'll discuss uh, future, future adaptations, or that will be our open discussions, to discuss future, future adaptations and other ventures. So, okay, this, this objective of the workflow is to, the contribution of seduction zone volcanism to global carbon cycle, uh, to further our understanding of all in deep time and deep carbon, carbon cycle. Understand the temporal tense of seduction zone interactions with crustal carbon platforms. Understand how continental arc lengths have varied as a proportion of total seduction zone lengths through time. Identify major changes to the nature of seduction interoceanic versus continental. You guys are all aware of this. And then understanding the properties of the oceanic crust as it's being fed into the seduction zones. Uh, whether properties such as the crust age, upper crust CO2 levels, and upper crust sediment thickness can be linked to atmospheric CO2 flux. All right, so I'm just going to go through the tools that we used in our workflow. Our master language, our master scripts were all written in Bash, um, as you would see in terminal or from that. Um, so Bash has an ability to call other scripts. It also has the ability to call other programs, such as GMT5. We used a lot of the GIS tools from GMT5. Um, and a lot of the outputs that came out of GMT5 are in, well, a lot of information that we wanted to extract was in text format. So the GRE track outputs are in text, so we had to extract values by slicing and extracting the values using uh, arc scripts. So if you, um, I don't know if you guys know the name of Python came from. Um, it came from Monty Python, so that's how the language is made. So I'll just, I'll just introduce G plates. You all were pretty much to be familiar with what it is. You, you all are probably familiar with what it is. <coughs> uh, it's a virtual geological observatory. <coughs> divides interactive plate tectonic reconstructions, geographic information system functionality, raster data visualization. Enables both visualization and manipulation of plate tectonic reconstructions associated with data through geological time. It's basically a quick, quick, user-friendly interface for Visualizing plate tectonics reconstructions. Um, we did. We, this was G plates wasn't used in any of our workflows. We did use it to test outputs and to create our to do the cookie cutting for our carbon platforms. But our workflows didn't use G plates. So moving away from G plates, what we had to use was Pi G plates. And what Pi G plates is an application programming interface. Basically, what it does, it exposes the G-Plates functionality to Python. Um, the power of being in a, <coughs> being within a Python environment uh, gives us the power to automate these functions. And what I mean by automation is you're able to repeat a series of mundane steps over and over again. An example would be calculating seduction node lanes. So if someone wanted to calculate seduction zone lengths manually in g plates, it would be a massive chore. It's better if you can automate it. And this is made possible with the Pi g plates functionality. So Python is a, it's a high level language. It's a good language to learn, guys. Um, it's, there's a lot of libraries, with data analytics. It's also very good for um, GIS analysts. And it's open source. And it's just very easy, you just import the um, PyG plates module in the Python library from the libraries. So why did you bother with Bash at all? An orc? Ah, well, okay, <laughs> we started off writing Bash. I had, it, was, it was going to my mind when we started off, but um, I think the main reason was we used a GMT 
extensively. I suppose you could use OS and just call GMT scripts from OS or the OS module from Python. But I felt it would be, we, I, when I think about it now, I think it would have been a lot pretty messy to do. Um, but I suspect we could have done it, but we worked with what we had and it was, it was it worked out fine. Okay, that's fine. Um, I was curious actually. But GMT5, this, yeah, this was the main reason. Yeah, I mean the Pythonization of G-plates is, is, is still in its early stages. I've used it quite a bit oh. actually. I, I did actually. Have you? I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't like it because it's because it's, it's just Python. But I mean, it's it's, it's a very it is a very useful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good. very useful way to interact with stuff. What's really good is like breaking it down into functions <coughs> and stuff, breaking it into tools. It's very hard to do that in, in a Bash environment. I, I attempted it, but it's just. I'll explain that later in the design features. Okay. Um, oh yeah, guys, just feel, feel free to stop me at any time. Um, I, I, I speak very quickly. If anything doesn't, if you feel anything's unclear, just, just stop me at any time. So, so our Pi G plates, we have, we have two Pi G plate scripts in our workflow. The main one was Resolve Topologies. And what Resolve Topology script does it receives the plate kinematic model, and it receives the edge. And what it does, it reconstructs the plate boundaries to that edge specified. And from those plate boundaries, um, it writes out the total seduction zone geometries, seduction zone left polarity geometries, seduction zone right polarity geometries, uh, ridge transforms, and the total plate boundaries um, for the result of all these can do. And with that, we can create our first workflow, so where we calculated total seduction zone lengths. So you can see here, we have our workflow, and it's very simple. It just, it just represents our script, and it's just really four lines of script, four lines of code, I mean, <coughs> and it's a loop. So within this box, these steps are repeated um, 400 times, so 400 steps. So our plate kinematic model, our Cat Matthews model, we went from zero to 400, and we constructed the seduction zone geometries, and then we calculated their lengths. Um, there are probably multiple ways of calculating lengths. I'm not going to go too much into it, but this is the GMT way that we did it. And at one iteration, it, what it does is it writes out the age and the seduction zone, the total seduction zone length. So it goes through until it reaches 400, and then it just terminates. It's, it was meant to be um, very straightforward. However, that wasn't exactly the case. We did run into a slight issue. And <clears throat> the issue, like, when Sabin initially ran the script with the Matthews model, we noticed things were, weren't quite clear. Like, we seemed to be like, something's, something's a little off. So being smart as Sabin is, he decided to compare it to something that he knew. So previously in another study, Sabin manually uh, calculated seduction zone lengths of the Maria Seaton model. And then, so he knew what the seduction zone lengths for the Maria Seaton model because he actually went through it like 200 steps. He exported it 200 steps from G points and then went, put it into ARC. And then I think he cleaned it out and then calculated the total lengths of it. Uh, so he knew what they were, and he said, so OK, I'll, I'll put the seed model into our workflow and see what it outputs. Just, just get a, have, a, have an idea what it outputs. And you can see there's a lot of noise. This is this exaggeration of the, um, of the true values, or the expected values. So we had a little problem. Um, the problem of what it, how it arose is we were using um, G plates in a way I guess the traditional sense of using deep places is to visualize the data, whereas we were actually calculating the, the lengths of the geometries, uh, which hadn't really been done before. And in some cases, when they're doing the result topologies, when, when the boundaries are being resolved, in some cases, you can have two features with two different IDs. And as a result, if you have two, two features contributing to a boundary with two different IDs, both will be included in the result topologies. Output. So that was a problem for us. 
So we had to come up with a workaround. Uh, so, as you can see, okay, John gave us a script that outputted these anomalous segments. Rather than having to look at every geometry, he was able to identify these segments and give us a basket of segments that were anomalous, which was very useful. It saved us from going through every single geometry and finding the new duplicates. So we had a small contained basket that we had, and basically what we had to do, we had to come up with a logic to decide what to keep and what to get rid of. And for your human eyes, it's very easy. You can just look at it and go, yeah, yeah it's very obvious. It's just like, we'll just take out these segments and those segments. But for a computer, um, you have to sort of come up with a logic for it to follow. Um, it, it sounds, it's going to, I'll run through this logic, and it's very straightforward. But um, at the time, we had, to, we had to come up with this logic. So what we did was we had, we grab, okay, imagine these are the seduction zone geometries. And I spaced them apart so that we can see their lengths and their IDs. So these are the unique IDs, and we spaced them apart. And then we got a list of these IDs for all the segments, and we sorted them by their length. So as you can see, six and five are the longest, followed by number one, the third longest, and then seven, fourth longest, and so on. And then we started at the top of the longest segment, and we compared that segment to all the other segments. And we, we, in our comparisons, we looked for whether the, the, the other segment was a duplicate or a subsegment. So an example of subsegment would be seven, eight would be a subsegment of seven. So compares, when we compare six to five, Five gets blacklisted because it's a duplicate. Uh, so six is jump step. So five gets um, blacklisted. It's a duplicate. We, we cross it off. We put it in the blacklist. We take it out of the checklist. Then we go to number one. Two and three are in subsegment of one. So we put it in the blacklist and take it out of the checklist. Oh, am I going too fast, guys? Okay. <coughs> number seven is a eight and nine are, are blacklisted because they are subsegments of seven. We also compare to all the other segments, and there's no relationship. There's no if they're not duplicates, so they're not subsegments, and so on. So we get to the last, uh, which is number four, and that's um, number four doesn't have, if you, number three has already been blacklisted, so we don't even check it, we just check it against the, all these guys. So the, what we, the outcome of this is we get full connectivity, we don't have any gaps, and also we don't have any duplicates, so we don't have any double up. So, so we have a logic that works for simple scenarios. So most of the, the anomalous segments were pretty, weren't too complex, but they were long enough to make create a lot of noise. So using that, this, uh, we ran our workaround with the Seaton model. And it was a success. We managed to reduce all the noise. Um, so the red is our outputs using the workaround. And yeah, purple is the expected values. So some of the differences that you see are the, the effect of the projections. So I did it in an equidistant projection in ArcGIS. Yep. I think that's the purple line. Right. And your one, I think, is the red one. Yeah, I was always Wait. suspicious of why. Because I was yeah. going into the same those areas where we had displacement trying to find yeah. like cases or edge cases or something. Where yeah, I mean, there, there may be work. edge cases as well. But very the small, fine. very small systematic offsets are the results of a different projection. Assuming it's a sphere, or assuming that it's a you know, complex spheroid thing okay. with equidistant projection. Uh, um, so yeah, that, that was our first workflow done. Um, so going on to the second workflow, where we're looking at intersections of carbon platforms and continents. So I just wanted to demonstrate. The, um, the objective of our second workflow, we had two objectives, and the, those two objectives could be achieved with one workflow. And I'll demonstrate why. 
Um, so we have our first our first objective is to find very carbon platforms in the volcanic arc. So we have our introduction zone, um, volcanic, and the um, sorry, the carbon platforms are sitting on the on the subduction side of the subduction zone. So they're not sitting on this side; they're sitting on this side. Obviously, we want the spotted criteria. And then the differentiation between oceanic arc subduction and continental arc subduction is the presence of a continental crust on the subducting side of the subduction zone where the volcanic arc would occur. So really we're checking for the presence of a continent and we're checking for the presence of a carbon platform. So really it's just one workflow achieving two objectives. Do you know what I mean? Well, it makes sense as I go through the slides. So looking at it from a, a sort of a jazz perspective or from a human's perspective is when you put it, when you learn all the data into, into jit plates, there's our reconstructed carbon platforms, there's our subduction zones, and highlighted in the red is what we, the, the segments that we kind of we want to achieve. I haven't really specified the distance, but I'm just sort of like ballpark estimates. Okay, this is what we want. I want to measure these lengths, these lengths, and those lengths. Um, you would think, oh, okay, why, which, why don't we just create a buffer around these subduction zones? Um, that's not the case because we want to only look at one side of the subduction zone. We don't want to look at the other side of the subduction zone. So we create a buffer. We end up looking on the other side, which we try and want to minimize. We don't want to do this. We just want to look at the arc side, or the side where the volcanic arc will go. Right, so this is our second workflow. Um, looking at the top, our first step was again using the resolve topology script, but this time we are looking at we're we extracting the left polarity subduction zones and the right polarity subduction zones. Um, I'll explain why, or because why the reason why is we need to look at the right correct side of the subduction zone, so we need to sort of treat them separately. Um, What's right versus left? Sorry, I'm being. Okay, so the direction of, of so <coughs> at flow. So you have a. I'm going to explain it again in another slide. Okay. But I, can, I guess working. very quickly, as you digitize a line, say yeah. from bottom to top, if subduction is happening in that direction, it's um, left. That's just how we encode the polarities in G plates and the geometries. Oh, okay. So that's a, that's a G plates quirk. Yeah. Well, you've it's got to encode this polarity somehow, right? Uh, uh, to keep track of it. So, so yeah, this is that's a slide okay. can demonstrate it. Yeah. So, okay, so digitize ads in the first line, puts in the next dot, next dot, and then he, he just finishes it there. Um, you can imagine that, like, this is the direction of subduction. This is facing right, but it's from the perspective of the first point to the last point. And again, so these would be classified as right polarity, because the digitizer put in this first point there, and he put in the last, even though the arrows are pointing left. Do you know what I mean? And then this again, this is left polarity. So he puts in the first point, the last point, I say, okay, so from this perspective, we look left, so that's left polarity. First point and last point um, flipped upside down. That's, but it's looking right, but it's actually left near the image. It, it's just because G plates doesn't but you have, have the both, ability. Yeah, that's all right. To, to okay. compute the uh, you know convergences on the fly to, to determine the polarities and then figure out which one's the overriding plate and things okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think it's just just a nomenclature thing, isn't it? You know which way around. Yeah. Yeah, sitcom has realized on this as well. Yeah. So the second high deep weight script that we have is reconstruct features. So what it can do is reconstruct um, our carbon platforms and our continents to the eight that's specified in this loop. So yeah, zero or two or four hundred, whichever loop, whichever point it is there. I'll just show an example. So these are carbon platforms that have been reconstructed at hundred and eight. And the same thing with continents, I mean, we can stop it to 100 MA. So if, this, if we're at the 100 iteration, 
these targeted platforms will be created from the reconstruct features script. And you can also see the subduction zones that will be that will come from our results topology script for 100 MA. And I'll, I'll try and demonstrate it again with the video. So, so with our video, so imagine this is like a loop. Um, and at each loop, they're the same. This is 386. This is actually visualization P5 G in, in uh, G plates. But for this purposes, we'll just think of it as okay, 386 MA. What are the outputs of Pi G plates? So from the reconstruct feature script, we would get these um, carbon platform polygons and the continent polygons. Um, or the continent polygons. And then we, from the result of all these scripts, we get the selection zones. I've also included the MLRs in this video, but, but yeah, so we get the, the, the top lot, we get the plate boundary. Um, let's just speak to that. So, rather than using like a buffer, we use a tool called GI Track, or GMT GI Track. And the ability of GMT Jardy Track is that we can look at the correct side of the seduction zone. And I'll go into that in a bit of detail, but first I'm just going to describe what GMT Jardy Track is for those who aren't familiar. Um, it receives the depth of geometry and it receives the grid. So what it does, it samples the grid values at the vertices of the vertex, um, vertices of the geometry. Unless you specify the cross profile um, functionality, because we're not really interested in looking at values of vertices, we're really looking, interested in looking at full coverage. And so you have these cross profiles that strike across the subduction zone geometry. And at, along those cross profiles, we have a profile interval. And at these profile intervals, it samples the grid. So what I mean by grid is, you probably are asking, well, where's the grid from? We create the grid from the reconstructed feature. So we create a mask um, that specifies the presence of a reconstructed feature, a carbon platform, or a continent um, polygon. So any, so if you imagine the grid sort of has full coverage of the globe, and each grid value is a longitude, latitude, and a value associated with it. So any grid values within the polygon would have a value of one. Any grid values outside the polygon have a value of zero. So it's a, it's a Boolean raster that indicates the presence of a feature. So we convert our uh, reconstructed features of polygon our carbon platforms into a grid. So imagine this is a grid, not a polygon. And in our GI track profiles at our intervals, it samples the neighboring grid value. And it sees the grid value the value of one, it will say, okay, well there's a carbon platform present um, at this at this location. We can also specify the profile length which is really our, are going to be our search distance. What is our search distance? But divided by two. So in this case, this is 1,000 kilometers. And let's say our search distance is 500 kilometers. So it would be half of that. It would be 500 kilometers from the geometry to its, the furthest point that it can search or should search. Is everyone clear that? Yep. Yeah. So we require the journey track tool um, with separately for our, our left polarity and right polarity subduction zones. And I'll just demonstrate to you the outputs, or what the outputs look like in text format, because we needed to extract values from the text. And also what it looks like if you load it in G-Plates. We have these crossbow files that strike across um, and you have a reconstructed 
carbonate platforms. And as you can see, this all of these values uh, contribute to one plus per bar. Um, the first column is longitude, second column is latitude, and each of these values are the intervals along the cross per bar. So you see there's an axis, there's like a negative axis and a positive axis. We exploited this because if we could, we can, if we have like a, if we have a, uh, a left polarity seduction zone, um, negative is the left side, positive is the right side. So we can just look at the negative values. We can just let's say we would just want to look at the we're looking at the negative. Sorry, the uh, left polarity seduction zones, and we just say, okay, well, we don't want to look on the other side, so we will remove the positive values because we just want to look at the left side. So I'll demonstrate here. So we remove one side of the Jolly Jack profile, and what I didn't show you in the last slide is the last column is the sampling value. Um, so if it has a value of one, it indicates that that profile is a intersects with the carbonate platform. And the example of the last one uh, that will have values of zero, that indicates the cross profile does not intersect with the feature. So we use OP just to look at look through each of these profiles. And we look at the last hole and find whether there's a value of one. And if there's a value of one, we increment our counts. So that count, if it has a value of one, it's, it's a cross profile that intersects with the carbon platform. So ultimately, we end up with a count of cross profiles. With this count, we multiply it by the cross profile spacing. So in our cases, we had uh, ten. We had made ten kilometers our cross profile spacing. So an example would say you have three cross profiles that intersect the carbon platform. We multiply three by ten, so it means 30 kilometers um, contributes, well, 30 kilometers of our succession zones intersect with the feature. So um, if we had to sort of specify a distance to a maximum distance to search. Um, we had to come up with a value that we could, we could somewhat justify. I guess this is going to be open to this more discussion. But the way, the way we kind of came up with this value is we got the longitude and latitudes of the volcanoes of the world database. It's maintained by the Smithsonian Institute of yeah, Global Volcanism Program, which was our, uh, content arc volcanoes and island arc volcanoes. And we loaded it into arc. In present, and uh, we loaded the present day seduction zone geometries in R, and we just used a tool to find a tool called NIR. And what NIR does, it looks at each of the volcanoes and it finds the shortest distance to the other feature, which is our seduction zones. So we end up with a distribution of um, distances from the volcano to the seduction zone. We just took some simple stats. We just took the mean, the median, minimum, and max. And we sort of said, OK, well, we'll take the mean, and we'll add standard deviation. Oops, that fell off there. And it was a value of 447 kilometers. So that means our profile spacing, um, or our across profile specs are these values. So you have to multiply 447 by, by 2 and get a value of 894. And we sampled at 10, we may create 10, 10 sampling points per site by specifying 444.7 kilometers and its profile space at 10 kilometers. So moving on to our very last workflow. So this workflow, the lot of results that you saw yesterday, um, what the team presented, uh, came from the third workflow. And we just applied some of the some of the similar ideas in our previous workflow where we used GRD track. But this time we have our seduction zones at each time step. And we also have our 
eight cross splits, uh, seven thickness splits, and uh, we created a grid from, we created the upper CO2 levels, in, we created the CO2 levels in the upper crust grid uh, using the, using the, uh, the using Jared's paper. And it was pretty straightforward. We just used GMT, GRD map, and applied the equation. And it's very straightforward. We have to take out some negative values. Uh, we just converted them to zero. So again, we some of you might be confused as to why I'm using cross profiles again. The reason being is if we don't use the cross profile option, it's just going to sample at the vertices. So again, we had to, I had to, well, I didn't have to, but it's one way of doing it is you create, you create a cross profile and you sample along the cross profiles. You have to specify a length and an interval. The other way would be to break down the line into multiple points and then do the GRD track, but to save ourselves from doing an extra step, I just did cross profiling. So the outputs were, rather than bull being Boolean values, is actual values taken from the grid. And we just take the middle one, because it has a sampling interval of zero, which means it's at the subduction zone geometry. And we just iterate through all the cross profiles and take that, that value. And we just append it into a single column. And then we just use awk to generate some stats from that column. And then we just continue the next time step. So it is that single column so it is that single column contributes to the stats of one op, one row. So for example, that would just whoops. That would just be for one age. Just I just don't want to confuse everyone. So that's one age. And then it was just with the steps would be for the next stage, and then we'll just take the stats of that distribution. So, yeah. so I'm just going to discuss design features of my of, of the workflows. Where we've designed it is with no hard coding, so it allows some flexibility for a user. So the user can specify the kinematic model features, two age, bum age, and grids. So you don't really have, we're not restricted to the carbon platforms that we're using. We can put in anything else and see what, see how, or apply the, so second workflow, flow, um, second workflow, the tools that we use in the second workflow to observe the intersection with, with the reconstructed feature and the subduction zone. So you, you, that feature could be up to you as well. Like you're not restricted to that. And also degrees. Um, a uh, two age and from age, um, they must stay in the constraints of the kinematic model because the workflows are modular, so it allows the user to adapt, adapt to their needs. So I tried to break it down into different functions um, just to make it into different sections. I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. Oh, I'll open up the code. Uh, actually, I'll do it now. GitHub code in our GitHub repository. Um, so we have our, our main script, which is DCO demo analysis. And it calls two other shell scripts, um, the seduction zone analysis and our ocean crust analysis. So the seduction zone analysis actually includes the first workflow, which is our calculating our total seduction zone lanes. And the second workflow, um, calculating lengths of seduction, intersecting with carbon platforms and continents. So you can specify block files, uh, the location files button, um, the model features, carbon, uh, continental, with uh, continents from age to age, and, and so on. And I'll, I'll step into this shell, into the script that gets called.
a subscript for a seduction zone analysis. And I'll just scroll down to So I, what I've done is I found I defined a a function called find subduction length contained feature. So it will receive a feature mask, the left subduction zone polarity and the right subduction zone polarity, and the cross profile um, specification. So you can just take this, and what it'll do it'll, it'll output a value of the total subduction zone length that inspect the feature. I'm just showing you how I designed the code. So going back, um, another thing is the Python plate scripts the, 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 are the core tools that we used. They're um, it's not restricted to this workflow too. I could just give you a copy of my Python of these Python plate scripts from the workflows, and you could just easily use them. They're very transferable. And we're not exactly restricted to using a geoprocessing tool with GMT5. There's like a wide range of other tools that can potentially use um, that could be open source. And just, I'll just lead this to the discussion. Um, we can, um, if you have ideas for adaptations to workflow or questions about the workflows, um, or if you can think of like an alternative idea. Uh, for another analysis, um, yeah, well, this is the time to discuss. But just if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Okay. I don't bite. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. No questions. No. Uh, okay. Um, so I I thought that the at least the intention was that the PyG plates. Um, Polygons are all are all uh, shapely features, something like that. They're and actually so GMT. We create GMT. I thought, no, but I thought that when you access them in PyG plates, they come back as like a as a as a shapely feature we, collection can, or something. You right? can specify how they get written out. They they get written out as a file. Um, we don't we would say we the Python environment. You just call the script. And it writes out a file, yeah. the GMT format, you can specify a shape file format for its wide. So I guess I'm making a suggestion because it may be a, it's not not passing what you did there, but I think in principle you might be able to you know, and particularly since you probably could ask if this is true. <laughs> but I think that they're shapely, they're the features are sort of there's an interface to shape you through that, which means that you don't have to come out of the Python layer at all to do all the intersection and questions. I don't think they're really, I don't think they're exactly shapely things. I mean, I guess they're sort of the same things that you might be in G plus and G plus is like the one you can see down in the GL and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think the GMT thing or the shape file thing only comes in and then you can export them to a file uh, within Python or a Python object. I don't know whether they're. They are kind of some sort of object. But I guess the thing is that you can query like segments. So this issue of the distance, you can just query the
So I guess the only, I mean, the, the only thing that I've noticed when I was looking at that is that you have all these profiles across the Kelvin platforms. Yeah. In some cases, they're kind of like overlapping, and in some cases, there are gaps because the line is kind of curving. And the only way that I can suggest to do something that's not exactly the same but similar would be to, because it's very easy to pull out the distance between a point and a line. So you just iterate over every single bridge point that's in the Kalman platform and say how far is each one of those points of subduction zone. And I don't think it's that's really actually like a yeah. line plate, well, which is not the same thing because you're kind of like going along the subduction zone and finding the Kalman platform, so it's that going through the Kalman platform to find the subduction zones. But the other side as well, we don't have the main thing. Yeah, so you find which one's on the line like first. That's that I mean, that's what you want to write when you want to count on something like so. Yeah, but if you do it at the bridge point, you end up finding, let's say, bridge point on the other side of the production. Oh, yeah, that's so you can count every uh, another step to distinguish override versus. I mean, visually, in most cases, there will be the override in both things that are one and the other being counted as one of them. Yeah. You can still check for that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but I guess the thing is that now, yeah, I mean, in, in Python place, you have access to the polygons and bits of polygons. And there are, that makes sense. Okay. So just a general concept. And some tools, to, uh, which, are, which are talking about, there's a bunch of tools that. Um, Areas and distances, proximity to the things. I had to use some of those tools to yeah. resolve problems for the app, and I had to yeah. find like, yeah. Yeah. One of the reasons that the intermediate files were written out is so that we could visualize it in G plates and check that all the workflows were working. Yeah. Uh, we have a little bit of it. It seems like everything came out nice and easily, but there was a lot of trial and error. That's like, yeah, it was, it was good to have um, the outputs. Yeah, those duplicate subduction zone segments really threw us off for a while. Yeah. We, we identified the problem very quickly, but solely that problem to, well, primarily Sam a little time. Yeah, you came up with an idea too. We tried GMT. We had like two special. Is it, a, is it a way in which those things are built, or is it sort of a fundamental is it, a, is it a property of the way that you construct the reconstruction polygons in the first place that they're, all, they're always going to be overlaps, or is it something you can look out for and avoid in future reconstruction? So G plates can handle these things typically, but it's a legacy issue from how the plate reconstructions were made in the past uh, to fix, we call them rubber banding artifacts of when you don't have lines that intersect. So the user may duplicate a subduction zone and then just add an extra point, a few points to make it longer. And so these things look like the same thing, but they have unique feature IDs. And and so, so G plates can't very easily distinguish them. So it outputs both of them. And so so but Sam but but, but, the, but the script that John wrote to identify these things, I mean ultimately this can be Included in the export functionality of GPlace so that they could be detected at least and labeled on the fly, right? Yeah, so, so they can be detected and labeled. But not necessarily, yeah, removed. But Sam's yeah. workflow removes them as well. So it's very good for plotting anyone who's plotting subduction zone T to get rid of those duplicate triangles. So, so from, from this whole thing, I mean, that, that entire work will be included in the GPlace export uh, functionality. Because sure. that, 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 uh, that would seem to me the logical way forward. So to think, eliminate this post-processing step, yeah. right? The only obstacle there is that we haven't had the time or opportunity to test edge cases. Like, the, there, I, I, I can foresee that there would be edge cases where you might lose small segments of a subduction zone or introduce a few gaps. Right. But John is very good at designing tests for edge cases. <laughs> okay.
Any questions? Go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so I guess the, 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 the main, yeah. So, so the, I mean, going back, I guess, to to sort of Louis' initial uh, comment, I guess the what the, the, the potential obstacle for the sort of average uh, user, as opposed to the extreme power user, you know, to to use these workflows is that, I mean, uh, so first they, they they have to install Python, PyG, Plays, and GMT5 on their computer. And so, yeah. and so, uh, so, which is often an obstacle, you know, for people. Yeah, and so, GMT five as well. We have to. Uh, yeah, but yeah. So, yeah. so I guess my, I guess what well, my comment is that right, in, in in order to actually encourage the uptake of this, I, I would think it would be highly desirable to include in in the readme file or something like that to include some instructions of all the things that the user actually has to do before they can. Well, so they can, I was just so you've got all that, do you? Yeah. I was just yeah. a completely alternative approach, which is to bundle the whole lot up into a Docker container and make it available. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what we do with all of our stuff, right? And then you can guarantee that they've got GMT5 with all the bug patches yeah. and bugs patched and everything and just release it. Mm -hmm. We did we we consider that, that as well. And I mean, iPython notebooks would be a, a good option as well. But I mean, the more complete package, as you say, is to bundle everything. Make it available. Yeah. Because then you also, you cross platform, right? Because otherwise, yeah. if someone who's on a Unix machine, or GMT, and you pull a few users, then. Yeah, so for Windows users, that, that becomes an additional obstacle. Yeah. I, I guess the um, problem, I mean, I don't know how big, say, a Linux virtual machine is, but. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the simple problem, I mean, with, with uh, that I've run across with Docker virtual machines is that the default memory allocation tends to be quite small. And then if you're not aware of that as a user, then all of a sudden it doesn't work and you don't initially understand why, because you've just run out of memory. Yeah. There wasn't enough memory allocated to the, the virtual machine. The current one is, doesn't use a virtual machine, doesn't use the same system right on the Mac, the latest. Okay. It? So it's better. Right. I don't know about the memory thing. It should, uh, it should be limited in the same way. But I don't know on Windows if it's still running in a virtual box. Yeah, that's that's a really useful tip. Um, I mean, the, one of the reasons we didn't explore that is that uh, we, you know, Sam and Joe, we had such limited time. I think it was like what fourteen hours per week to work on this stuff. Yeah. And there were so many other scientific goals as well. So. Sure. Yeah. Sort of as and there's some tipping up. The, the final release is that it's just there on the on the Docker Hub or something, and you can still get it. It's kind of a nice way to release. Mm -hmm. the yeah, I think that's that's a good idea. I think that's what should happen. Yeah. Cool. Hey, thanks, guys. So, if there's anything else, feel free. But you can ask me afterwards too. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you.